very much for meeting with us. Sure. You know, when I think about the internet, I think, you know, not, I, I think of sort of a series of, of, of trade-offs. Um, you know, on the one hand, uh, you want the internet to be free. You want it to be a vibrant tool for people to communicate freely around the world. That's really its beauty, you know, just instant communications. Right. And right. that's wonderful, right? I mean, you know, we're already seeing regimes like the Chinese regime and others sort of having to struggle with this incredible uh, a tool for cooperation. You know, on the other hand, there are legitimate cybersecurity issues, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, terrorist networks using the Internet or, frankly, whether it's our own networks, more broadly speaking, being vulnerable. And so there's a little bit of a tension there between wanting to keep regulation and the government out of it, but also recognizing that it's, a, you know, something that requires protection. And, of course, you know, um, one of the wonderful things about the Internet, of course, is just its sheer vibrancy and that everything is possible um, uh, in, in some tension with that, of course, is the need to protect intellectual property. I mean, we won't, if it's, if in some, if, you know, distant future we're in a world where, you know, there is no value attached to a novel or to a poem or to a movie or to a music or to music. I mean, guess what? People aren't going to make music and movies <laughs> anymore. Right, and right. so, you know, there's a series of tensions that need to be carefully balanced. And I think it can be done. It's, you know, it's, it's technically complicated. I think it can be done. Right. Um, it's just something that requires a lot of attention. Right. So speaking uh, of uh, intellectual property, do you think that in the wake of SOPA and PIPA, do you think that this new conversation is opening the opportunity to re-examine the U.S. copyright system? Well, um, so I'm not an expert in the in the right. copyright system, um, so I tend to sort of fall back on on. on on key principles. Um, I was not a supporter of SOPA PIPA um, for a bunch of reasons, but one of them was that it sort of in some ways deputized uh, network companies and others to either raise their hands and say, hey, we think there may be a national security violation here, or, uh, you know, to, uh, to be a, a little aggressive around people who they suspected were, were not treating intellectual property uh, right. Look, to my way of thinking, I, there's probably a lot of uh, analogies with copyright law. If you violate it, I mean, if you illegally download movies, that's a problem for you. Uh, and I think you're the person, whether you're an institution or an individual, uh, the, uh, against which the authorities need to seek redress, right? Not against the network companies who can't possibly manage, you know, monitor all the traffic right. on there. And I, and I think on the, on the security side, too, look, um, just as the police need a warrant to knock on your door or to step onto your property, you know, in a dangerous world, you need the authorities to have the ability to go in and look at somebody's email or to go in and look at somebody's traffic or whatnot, but they need to do so with a lot of oversight, meaning they actually need to go to uh, the judiciary or to somebody and say, hey, here's my case. I need you to give me a warrant. So I, I, I think you know, these things are things that we need to debate. Right. And of course, the internet is faster, it's bigger, it's a lot less controllable than handing around pieces of exactly, dead trees, yeah. right? But right. I, I, I think that the, the analogies to the way we've always thought about this stuff are a good, a good starting point. I have no problem with the sort of privileged group of people who build the networks, who lay the fiber optic cable, who buy the servers, you know, who actually construct the internet. They obviously need a return on their investment, absolutely. If you're not paying people to make that kind of investment, they won't make that investment. Right. However, and here's where, the, where, where this is really important, they then can also, I think, step in and think in terms of anything other than being a common carrier. You know, they can't say, well, I don't much like your business, so we're going to treat you differently than my business. And by the way, I mean, if you're sort of historically attuned, uh, again, there, there, are, there are historical models for this. I mean, in the late 1800s, um, you know, one of the ways that the robber barons sort of tied up the economy was because they owned the railroads and they would charge differentiated rates depending on whose stuff they were carrying. If they were carrying my right. fellow steel baron stuff, they'd get a discount. If they weren't, they weren't. That obviously doesn't work. That right. kills a competitive market. It kills innovation. Right. So even though we're talking about technology that is, you know, changing every single day, there's still some basic principles looking back to the way the railroads were run in this country 100 years ago that I think we need to be mindful of. Because, yes, um, you know, we can't at some level, as much as we say that the companies that build the backbone and the, you know, the, the infrastructure of the Internet, they absolutely deserve to get paid for doing so. You know, so when somebody comes at me and says, hey, I want to charge you a little bit more to download three gigabits than to download you know, three kilobytes, right. okay, that's a fair discussion. Right. But when you start getting into differentiating kinds of content, particularly when those backbone companies sometimes own content companies, I, I start to get pretty nervous. Around the blogosphere and all of that, for uh, folks that are in support of net Neutrality. They have uh, there's an overwhelming sense that uh, a lot of the politicians uh, 
you know, in in the Congress and in the Senate, really don't understand, um, you know, the nature of the internet or the concept of the internet. And, you know, there's a the lot tubes. of yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> yeah, a series of tubes. So I just wanted to see if you could comment, just um, either in you know in the House or um, in any other context. What what is your sense, um, particularly when you're discussing this with um, your opposition? in terms of net neutrality, SOPA, PIPA, what, what is your sense of what they understand about the whole concept of the internet and its purpose in our society? Well, I think there's probably a generational divide. You know, you've got, uh, you know, in the House and the Senate, you've got people ranging from their mid-30s to probably their mid-80s or a whole right. older. And, you know, it won't come as a surprise that people who are, you know, I don't want to draw an arbitrary line here, and of course there's right, exceptions right. to every rule, but people who are in their, you know, 60s and above are probably, you know, they didn't grow up with the Internet. You know, they may have had a staff for a very long time, so they haven't had to deal personally with emails. So there's certainly a big generational divide. Uh, and you've got, but, you know, you've got uh, high-tech Internet entrepreneurs entrepreneurs like Jared Polis of uh, Colorado and others right. who are very, very knowledgeable on it. I happen to have been a tech banker back in 99 when everybody was a tech right, banker. Right. And um, So you've got that division. But then you've also got, I think, this, the same kinds of tensions that you have around other issues. I mean, there are going to be, let's just for sake of drawing a cartoon, there's going to be some you know national security, hardcore conservative types who are going to say, you know, maybe I'm willing to encroach on, you know, privacy and individual liberty in favor of catching those terrorists or however they right. want to frame it. Um, and uh, you know, so those tensions will uh, will will continue to exist. But I really do think it's uh, you know it's it's essential that people understand that the internet. And look, all you got to do is look at the market caps of companies like Google and and, and Facebook and whatnot to understand that that uh, it's not something to be taken lightly. I mean, this is this is as important to the future of this country as the highway system, as the railroad system, as the you know electrical power, as you know we all right. saw during the hurricane. You know, it's it's that essential to our our prosperity and to our security that we get that right. What's going to be the greatest challenge, if you can answer that? <laughs> yeah, well, let me let me answer that very generally, and then let's yeah. go back to kind of how we sure. think about the more online world and, and Internet as a sure. specific topic. Um, look, generally, you know, for the last 12, 13, 14, even longer than that, the country's been living beyond its means, you know. We sort of had it all, right? We had low taxes and right. two wars that we apparently wanted to fight and, right. uh, you know, a, a, a fairly robust Medicare and Social Security system and this and that. You know, we've, we've reached the point now where uh, the trade-offs have come home to roost and, and we need to do some difficult thinking. Uh, you know, all too often it becomes a fight between, you know, the left and the right, the Democrats and the Republicans, whatever. You know, what's interesting about that, what's most interesting to me is, um, yes, we should debate whether we're paying, you know, whether we're, uh, whether we're you know, government is 17 percent of GDP or 21 percent of GDP. But what's really interesting uh, and this is probably a good transition point into into internet and networks and whatnot. Is is where are there opportunities for win wins? Uh, you know, the Medicare, uh, the healthcare system is absolutely archaic and inefficient. Guess what? The Pentagon is also uh, you know inefficient in some pretty staggering ways. And if you can find ways of creatively and innovatively addressing those institutions, which by the way is very very difficult, um, you can you can uh, you know you can just make for a more efficient, better, uh, more uh, end oriented uh, government, which I think is key. So right. that's going to be very much, uh, you know, front and center here. Um, you know, with respect to uh, the future, you asked sort of about the future of the economy, too. You know, I, I do worry uh, quite a bit about, um, uh, you know, inequality in our society. Um, the fact is that we're a much more unequal country today uh, than we were 50 years ago. And that's for good reasons and bad reasons. It's, it's, you know, good reasons include the fact that the real world-beating American industries today are industries that require engineering skills, that require a lot of education. And that's a good thing. I mean, this is the future of our, of our economy in many ways. But it's also a scary thing and a bad thing in as much right. as it leaves a lot of people behind, which kind of gets me to the di digital divide question. I mean, I, you know, I remember when, um, when eBay first came out, right? When eBay right. first came out, all of a sudden, Americans' wealth, whether they knew it or not, went way up because all of that crap that you had in the attic or in the basement now was actually worth something. You know, and so that sort of can potentially transform, uh, you know, a household's life because all that stuff in your attic, somebody wants to buy it. You know, you have a really efficient market. By the same token, you know, there's a million stories out there of people creating apps or doing this or doing that and, you know, actually making a living doing it. But you can only do that if you're, A, educated enough to operate in that environment, and B, obviously in a world where you're wired, where you've got, uh, you know, bandwidth and where you've got, you know, the money to buy the equipment. So, you know, 
the larger inequality paradigm that I think we need to think about in this country is reflected too, and in some ways turbocharged, if you will, by the power uh, of networks, which if you can use them and you can get in there, it can change your life for the better. If you can't, you're going to get left even more behind. Right. Okay. Well, Congressman Hines, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. anytime. Yeah.